Carol, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I just need to see how this works. Okay. There we go. Okay, so it's very hard to follow Dan Katz because he's pretty well said everything. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to just basically reinforce uh, what, what Dan said largely. And I'm going to do it from the point of view of um, uh, the area of communities. So uh, I'll give you some hints as to why you might know something about communities. And I've got the wrong glasses on, so I can't see the, <laughs> the board. So I shall do that blindly. Um, so, I come from a world of software development. Um, I've been developing research software for a very long time uh, in a number of communities, particularly in biosciences and biodiversity, actually. So I build and sustain a lot of research software. I'm currently sustaining about five major uh, European and international level software platforms. And I also work with a lot of organizations that are also involved in um, software sustainability and research software. So that gives me some sort of uh, credibility. And I am that classical person who's juggling an awful lot of uh, different kinds of grants and different kinds of income streams that Dan mentioned, as well as volunteer work in order to be able to, to try to do the sustainability. And uh, as the kind of case study that I'm using in this, in this talk, is computational workflows, which Dan already mentioned a little bit about. That's just a particular kind of software. It doesn't matter uh, whether you know about it or not, but it's this very common way of being able to stitch together codes in order to be able to create data analysis pipelines. And they have machinery, which is itself software, in order to be able to make that work. Really underpins quite a lot of what we do in the biosciences and biodiversity world, as well as elsewhere. Now, as Dan uh, mentioned, there's a few workflow management systems out there, uh, and these are different kinds. Uh, in fact, uh, there's, uh, there's quite a lot of them. Here's, here's, here's a list. There'll be a short test later. Um, and there's about 324 at the moment. That's probably 310 too many, right? Because one can't sustain all of these. That's a lot of uh, wheel invention, reinvention. We don't like to reinvent wheels. Of course, uh, why are there so many? Well, it's fun for a start. Well, let's build another piece of software. Why not? That's what we like to do. We like to build software. Um, and it's part of the research ethos that Dan mentioned. You know, it's part of the fun of being a researcher. And they were also funded in some way, or at least resourced in some, some way. But are they sustainable? That's a good question. We, of course, do need more than one wheel. There's a lot of things about don't reinvent wheels, but a bicycle wheel and a monster truck wheel are quite different. So you do actually do need multiple wheels for different technical issues or types of data or different communities or, or different kinds of analysis or different kinds of users. And yesterday in a pre-workshop meeting, uh, Tom Honeyman kind of presented this whole notion of a sort of three tiers of uh, research, which again, I think uh, was, was a, reflected a bit in what Dan mentioned, which is uh, those codes that are sort of analysis codes, sort of one-off research, that's the research software. Um, prototype tools, where, uh, they're, they're, again, it's research software, there's a research need, uh, but there's a kind of more systematic development, perhaps, but it's still prototyping. We call this professorware, uh, so that uh, a professor can use it, but, um, or maybe studentware, but um, whether anybody else can use it is another issue altogether. And then the migration of that into, perhaps, research software infrastructure. And that's where research software becomes software for research. And that's also where you might find research infrastructure um, software. For example, of the kind that um, Elixir, the Research Infrastructure for Life Sciences, at the European level that I work with, um, is, uh, is kind of supporting. And that's professionalized products. And, uh, and communities uh, needed uh, to, we need community support in order to be able to move across this spectrum. Because it takes a village. And that was the kind of theme of my talk. And uh, this picture comes from a very nice piece of work done by the museum community um, in the US around uh, how to support their software uh, around a village notion. And I'll be coming back to this at the end. So to have a sustainable future, you really do need to sustain. You need to develop and sustain a workforce that can deliver the software, but also uh, a community that actually wants the software as well. And that's what I'm 
really going to be talking about that in my, in my talk. So the key, one of the key issues that I wanted to get across was the importance of collective action and responsibility. So uh, we have developers who will sustain, we have uh, researchers and users who want it, but there's a whole bunch of other people around a sustainability activity with respect to a community. And I'll be uh, briefly talking about who the kind of people are that you need in order to be able to do this. But we need trainers and we need um, project managers and we need uh, um, a community managers and so on. And we need to also, within a community, to move from prototype to research infrastructure that other people can then use um, and to be sustained. It, we need to really develop adoption, contributors, supporters, and drivers there. And that's what uh, Dan was really talking about when he was talking about incentivization and other kinds of, of models. So we have a kind of flywheel that we have to operate when we're doing um, those workflow systems and, and getting them sustained. Uh, the ones that are widely used, uh, more than the, the, the originator, um, so the ones that, that moved into um, sustained research infrastructure rather than remaining in uh, my one-off workflow system or a prototype, they all have communities. Because communities, both communities of de development and communities that are user communities, that support the core activity, and that's absolutely critical. Um, so that's reusability beyond the originators, um, and they really embrace the notion of these uh, different kinds of developer and, uh, and user communities. Because you need to build critical mass. So you need to build critical mass around your development and to maintain and actually expand on the code because actually you don't just maintain code, you also continually uh, do research and, and expand upon those codes and add new value to it. So the idea of you make something and then you just keep it going and maintain it, that's not true. The kind of prototyping -y, uh, research infrastructure piece is actually um, intertwined in many ways. But you also have to sustain and develop the community as well. And that actually requires a considerable amount of investment. And this works at varying scales. You know, there may be some uh, workflow system or other kinds of pieces of software that has quite a small developer team, quite a small community, but is very important to that community. That's quite different to something that works at a significant scale. But the thing I wanted to get across here was another wheel picture, the flywheel picture, of adoption flies sustainability, more adoption, more sustainability. Because just like all other software, workflow software, you use the one that everybody else uses because that's what basically happens. So visibility is deeply tied to adoptability, and that's deeply tied to uh, sustainability. So the first point I want to talk about is a sense of community closeness to the software. So the sense of, if you're going to sustain software in a community, you need to build closeness. Um, and that could be, I'm a direct user of the software, so that's, uh, I use a software, our software and effectively I will die in a ditch to support it. So if you can get people to die in a ditch for your software, you're done, right? That's really uh, great. Indirect is um, it's used by another code that I use. Um, so that means somebody else is looking out for it. So that's a bit like, you know, I didn't vote for Brexit because everybody else will, wouldn't have voted for it. You know, that kind of notion of, uh, or oh, I didn't vote against, against it, it's probably more, uh, more specific. But basically, mass kind of, uh, it's somebody else's job. Um, and that means it's nobody's job. And then distant, what code was that? Never heard of it, right? And so that gets uh, horribly neglected. Because as Dan mentioned, and I also, this picture was also in Michelle's uh, presentation, classic uh, comic, um, software is a patchwork. So what we tend to do is we act locally, but we do need to think globally. We can act on the software that we use, but we also need to think, well, what other software is important to it? Because we have this web of dependencies and, and hence a spectrum of visibility. And I've divided it into uh, two simple layers, uh, which may reflect uh, uh, more uh, the, the layers that, uh, that Dan mentioned. Uh, User-facing shiny thing and uh, underwear. So, uh, so user-facing shiny thing is when it's a new application, it's got a fancy interface, it's exactly to do with genomics, it's exactly to do with biodiversity, it's highly visible, it's the equivalent of the rocket, 
right? Whereas the underwear is the stuff underneath that you wouldn't normally see unless you were very intimate with whoever you were working with at the time. Um, it's big codes and little codes. It's often cross-domain, reusable code. Um, it becomes sort of overly familiar. It's stuff that's always there. And it's effectively like the rocket launcher. So nobody thinks about the rocket launcher, but they do think about the rocket. So this shiny thing versus uh, the, the underwear actually has an important effect on funding models. In fact, uh, because um, we have this uh, sort of supply chain, which is sort of reflected in the, uh, the chain of researchers, if you will. So I've put here, and this is, of course, very naive, just for a presentation, but at the top you might have a biologist, and I've sat in all of the panel meetings for these kinds of things, um, who is very keen on the shiny thing. All right, and, uh, the, and you may then have an infrastructure provider who is providing some really fundamental infrastructure which then su is supported by, say, a workflow platform, which is then supported by some fancy interface on top of that workflow platform and so on. Um, and so you've got this foregrounded software and backgrounded software. And at where you are in the different points, um, that's where your software is and that's where you're dying in a ditch for that software. But many funder programs can concentrate at the top. So, and then they go out to the community and they say, what software would you like? And your professor X of, you know, um, important biology in the University of Y goes, this shiny thing, right? Rather than under, un the underneath infrastructure. So that's, a, that's an interesting um, issue to do with sustainability. We also have a sustainability catch-22 with our communities in that uh, the levels of guarantee that you need in order to be able to adopt a piece of software that your research is going to depend on. Right, so if your research is, uh, you, you need to make sure that that software isn't going to disappear because if you're particularly going to buy into software that enables you to do research as opposed to research software, that software has to be guaranteed. To be, to be always available to you. So you have this kind of uh, reciprocity piece where um, users must trust that, uh, that um, developers will make that software fit for purpose, it'll always be available, and that they can then move their research in order to be able to bank on it. And developers, on the other hand, as uh, Dan mentioned, must trust users to do all that kind of uh, advocacy on their behalf, and um, actually cite it in order to be able to help sustain it. So you kind of this kind of download and go, uh, where you don't have any kind of credit associated with it. You know, we need to, to shift those cultural norms, as, as Michelle mentioned earlier, and really get across the notion of some sort of socialization that um, if you, you've got to use software or you'll lose it, but particularly you have to contribute to it or you'll lose it, and you have to report that you're using it or you'll lose it, right? So there's a whole uh, socialization piece, and the Software Sustainability Institute has a fellowship program that in part does some of that socialization in the community. And I'll, I'll briefly mention there was another manifesto. So this isn't the first manifesto of yours. There was another manifesto we did in Dachstuhl that many of us were there. I think uh, Neil Chiu Hong was there, um, which was about personal responsibility, that you will take personal responsibility to say, if I'm using some software, I'll cite it. But of course, we need to empower and incentivize people to do this. And this has to become a, a kind of normative practice within the community. The second thing I want to talk about is community co uh, cultivation. So, um, so again, I've, I've used a picture from the, uh, the Turing Way as well, slightly uh, enriched and enhanced. Uh, so you get some funds in order to be able to uh, sustain your software. And um, now you need two really big important parts. You need the community uh, to engagement with the processes and the infrastructure and the skills in order to be able to really build those uh, developer communities and build those um, uh, uh, user communities. And that means more than just more developers. That means uh, trainers and document writers and project managers and all the things that you need when you're doing a sort of piece of change management. And so communicate, what I wanted to get across here is that community cultivation uh, requires resourcing. 
and it also requires um, processes associated with it. And the second thing is you need access to the developers who can take on sustainability, and that may not be the people who originally uh, created that particular software. So you need to recruit people, and you also need to retain people and keep them interested in their work. If you, just, if you have a research software engineer who's interested in innovation and you give them maintenance all the time, you're not going to get a very happy research software engineer. And you need pathways uh, for people to be able to participate, which again, Dan mentioned with his codes of conduct and similar things. So you need access to research software is within software engineers within your organization, but also between organizations. So research culti uh, community cultivation, um, here's a, the, a, a slide shot from the Galaxy workflow community. Galaxy workflow community has invested heavily um, in its community, and it's now possibly one of the most popular uh, workflow management systems in the biosciences. And so it, it uses a great deal of volunteer support in that, but it has mentorships and training programs. It, it trains a thousand people in, uh, in one go on its online um, environment, so that it does once, once uh, or twice a year. So it's a really significant investment. So the investment is not just in developers, it's in all the community activities around it. So this slide comes from uh, Christopher Woods, and I like it very much. He has a piece of software that he's now taking into sustainability. What you have, first of all, is you have your kind of uh, research need, so you build some new software. Then the next stage is you get some more funding for it, and you kind of develop it into a more substantial prototype, uh, make it fit for purpose for people wider than you in the community, wider than the original originators. And here you might have the researchers who code, um, and you may have uh, multiple organizations, but typically you have a single organization, actually, with that. And then you go into this state, which is uh, a community software village where you have a whole bunch of different uh, income streams. And you have to now do the maintenance and the software support and community management becomes more than just building, having fun making, making the code. And, uh, and so this is where you have to begin to manage your contributions to give you some sort of explosion. So community cultivation, even to just stand still, but particularly to, to scale up and scale out, um, depends on building your developer base. You may not do that. You might just keep the same set of developers, but many people who want they scale out, they want to bring in more developers. You may want to bring, uh, widen out your user base. Okay, so you need to be able to build a bigger, a bigger user base. And I think uh, Tom calls these pathfinders to highway uh, makers to draw an analogy with uh, the wheel hitting the road, as it were, the infrastructure there. And you need all this kind of community expertise to be able to do it. Uh, to, you now need governance. If I'm going to have more than just my little team doing the development, I need governance around that development uh, process. Um, so that's uh, an, a, a big piece of things. I need contribution processes so that people can actually really uh, join in. I need um, developer support, but I also need documentation and training and ambassador programs to be able to go out and, and pitch about the software. Um, and then we also need user adapt, uh, adoption, advocacy, and user engagement, and, and examples. And this is social infrastructure that must be invested in. So what we're doing, what I'm trying to get across here in this piece, is that, that there's a complex social system at play. Uh, this is kind of a bit of a variation of the really nice picture from, from Michelle, which basically says, you know, there's the technical aspect, there's processes and policies, and then there's a social piece, uh, all sort of uh, jogging along here. So it's a complicated piece. Because what we're going from is from wizardry, so many of you build, build software or know about software, know about wizards. So these are people, ooh, this is magic software, and I'm the wizard king, to basically wizards behind a support desk. Uh, and you're going from unicorns, like I'm the special user for which this software has been built, to I'm just one of many uh, for which this software is now being managed. And this is a cultural change, right? So this requires change management. Okay, so actually when you engage with communities, building up these communities in order to be able to sustain your software and sustain those communities, you have this uh, 
change management from developer push to community pull. And as we heard, open source, sticking something on GitHub, is not the same as open development. It's all to do with change management. So the good things about, hey, I've got some more developers, and hey, I've got some more resources, and hey, I've got more users, is that you can share and spread the burden, you can ta tackle that technical debt associated with your platform and to maintain it. You can bring in some perhaps professionalization. But the bad news is if that doesn't go well, you just get people wanting to do more features and do more fun stuff and don't actually do the technical debt piece. You kind of have a, a kind of exclusion cult where, uh, ooh, you know, it was mine and now I don't want to really have people join in. And this is why we need codes of conduct and things like this. And you also have a lot of borrowed labor. And borrowed labor is tricky because it's voluntary. And so it's hard to actually uh, manage around, coordinate, and it has uncertainties associated with it. And if you have users who potentially could share the burden and, uh, sh and spread the burden, um, if they don't, uh, they just uh, they just make lots more demands. So new users can make new demands that enrich it, but they can also make a lot of demands that they may not be then following up with support. Um, and then you get this kind of diversification and and it can be quite quite painful. And if you're quite away, uh, the distance from your collaborators changes. So you go from collaborators you're directly working with to people who you aren't working with anymore. So you get this kind of remote distancing again in your, in your software. And that happened with a workflow platform that I ran for a long time. Um, and I stopped because I, I, I'm now helping Galaxy. Uh, because uh, for a long time, for, for well over 15 years, we ran this on lots of different kinds of grants, hundreds of thousands of downloads, hundreds of projects used it, um, a few were close collaborators, and they effectively subsidized everybody else. And then when we stopped, and said, that's it, we're done now because we're moving on to other things. All the other ones came out of the woodwork and said, but what about us? Well, did you, did you contribute? No. Oh, there we are. Uh, so, so there's a real issue here to do with um, sort of what you might call free riders. Okay. And so this briefly basically says community cultivation and change management, just like software isn't free, isn't free either. So the last piece I want to go on to, the, last, the fourth point, is, um, well, communities and uh, resources span boundaries. So again, Dan mentioned this, that uh, collaboration is actually often fundamental to the ability to sustain things, collaboration with other developers, collaborations with your users, collaborations of users with each other, and so on. So um, my experience is collaboration is considered necessary in order to really be able to deliver this. And that m typically means crossing institutional and national boundaries, right? And often our funding is trapped in institutional and national boundaries, or the delivery of software is trapped in an institutional boundary and the funding is trapped in a national boundary. Organization X has the money, but organization Y has the skills. What do we really do? And typically you get this phenomenon of just as the community is building up, the core funding do drops, right? Because, oh, you've done it now, that's it. Um, so what we have is this kind of community software village that we have to coordinate and then multiple independent funding streams that we have to uh, kind of coordinate as well. So this is a handy cut out and keep picture of um, all the different ways that we actually fund um, different software. There's different ways of directly resourcing it. So you can have the core funding, which is golden when you get actual resources to fund your, your project. You do diversification. So you kind of say, aha, you can reuse this in biodiversity and physics and so on. So you can get uh, funding uh, that way and spread the risk of your software, but that only works for some kinds of software. Um, you can have fees or subscription models or donations, but they're incredibly hard to deliver. Really hard to deliver, particularly in universities that don't have mechanisms of taking small amounts of money, actually. And you actually can't really tension your planning against having tiny contributions. And we haven't socialized research projects yet to actually make subscriptions uh, to software. Or you do indirect funding, and this is quite prevalent. So you get donut funding, and donut funding is where you get funding for all of the fancy stuff around the edge, but nothing in the middle. 
and that means you get lots and lots of extra features and you have to fund the core by stealth. So you hide it all, so it's, it's, it's stealth funding. Um, or you do borrowed funding, where you have a research mission project about, say, COVID, and, uh, and then you hide the fact that actually you're doing core development on your workflow platform on the side in order to be able to deliver it, and so you're top slicing. Or you have in-kind labor, which is volunteers through handshake agreements, which is, uh, again, challenging to manage. And our workflow systems, to go back to those, use all of these. Right, so I'm gonna, uh, I've got one more minute, and I'm going to try and beat Dan. Uh, so, um, so we have, or maybe, maybe I won't. Yeah. Anyway, um, so, uh, so Galaxy, for example, has a huge uh, international activity going on with uh, lots of different uh, uh, funders and lots of different organizations supporting it, including Australian Biocommons and elsewhere. State make much smaller, uh, and that's really supported by institutions who use that platform and then uh, donate it, as it were. So everybody else is subsidized by a few key um, uh, institutions, notably in Switzerland, actually. And Nextflow um, commercialized. So they basically said, well, we'll have this commercial wing and then we'll do a due model associated with it. So people do different kinds of things. Two different um, kind of funding support mechanisms that are used here. The first is to bridge that issue to do with um, communities not confined to one particular organization, is to get sponsorship from a big organization or a big community or a pan-national community that will kind of shelter you and support you and provide you the mechanisms. So many of those workflow, particular workflow systems and infra infrastructure that we support are supported by these international pan, uh, uh, pan national um, initiatives like Elixir, uh, for example, and that's, that's doing heavily supporting um, um, Galaxy, for example. Or institutional organizations like Switzerland who've decided this is what we're going to do and then we'll do development and then everybody else can benefit. And also, uh, societies are also part of this village. So the research software engineers we've heard a lot about. So soci the Society for Research Software Engineering is trying to is really helping with momentum of building up the importance of research software engineers within organisations. So there's someone you can go to when you get some money, uh, which is which is critical. And then the second thing that people are doing is setting up uh, social enterprises. So not-for-profits and foundations, and this thing I found out uh, last uh, this this year: community interest groups, uh, companies, community interest companies, which are a form of charity in in the UK, and these are a direct route to being able to channel funds that kind of go beyond the actual, say, university that you're in, that your your uh, researchers and your uh, developers will be in. So you can get, it's much easier then to get some um, industry engagement, it's easier to get uh, direct money into there. It's also easier to fund the people that uh, can do it versus where they physically are. Right, so that's the really important thing. Uh, and it gives some job security and career progression to um, your researchers, which was an important point made earlier as well. But the downside is they're not easy to do. They're painful. They need a lot of upfront investment. You get real complexity around tax and pensions and all sorts of things. Um, there's liability issues. And they really only work when you got to a certain level of community and you've got some kick start funding uh, in order to be able to make them viable. So my last two slides then sum up that funders are part of the village. So what could funders do? And I like this, uh, this picture here from uh, this, this uh, um, uh, Software Takes a Village a report uh, developed, by, developed by the museum community because it emphasizes the flywheel notion of uh, getting communities going in order to be able to sustain and so on. And it emphasizes technology, governance, uh, resources, and community all together. Um, so for community support, we probably need dedicated funds uh, to, for community cultivation and change management um, in grants or as separate grants. Um, we uh, need help with uh, social enterprises 
I think, to help set up those up and the governance around them because everybody's reinventing the wheel every time they try to do it. Um, and support organizations to enable them to have RSEs uh, so we've got a way to deliver software if needed. We want community nudges so we can nudge in our funding panels um, to do wheel reuse as opposed to uh, wheel reinvention uh, through FAIR, as was mentioned by, by Dan, uh, so that you need to find things that are available, and to cultivate um, research software engineers and to socialize the sense that software needs to be paid for. So there's things that we can do um, as, uh, as funders for, for that. Uh, funding flexibility will be awesome. So to enable collaboration, rather than funding where it just goes to, to these people in this organization, if we had much more flexibility that enabled funding that would embrace collaboration. Um, and that's why I do a lot of European funding, because uh, it fundamentally is built in, the collaboration. But I kind of had to coordinate that over decades to make that, to make that work, to get funds to the right stuff in the right place. And we need um, funds also to bridge between projects. So I had, in my career, an incredibly useful grant uh, from the um, Funding Council in the UK, which bridged between projects. So that meant I could keep the core team of developers going, regardless of whether I had a project for them at the time. It was called a platform grant. I don't even know if those things exist anymore. I'll have to ask uh, uh, Michael and, and Rachel if they exist. And to recognize that software is part of an ecosystem, and that includes that there'll be essential software that's invisible and probably will never come to funding. So we need to seek it out from our communities. And to recognize that software always has a core. And if you're just relying on volunteers to maintain your core, then you're in, then I think that's risky. Um, here are my acknowledgements, and I want to thank particularly Christopher Woods, Ian Cottam, uh, Tanya Allard, and Shweb uh, Sufi, who all contributed uh, to this presentation. And, and I've put some resources there, including some key resources from the Software Sustainability Institute on how to build your community. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat>